1233. We're ready. Is everybody excited? How many of you are excited? All right, I'm going to make you more excited um, because I'm going to ask you questions, and if you get the right answer, I'm going to give you a toy. All right, are you excited now? Yeah. I thought you might be. Okay, good, good. All right, is everybody out in TV land ready? I hope you are. Um, hopefully, hopefully nobody's having any audio problems. Let's get started. So, by the way, I'm Henry. Hi. Who are all of you? Are you nice people? I, I hope you turn out to be nice. That's good. All right. This is an experiment. Everything will fail. Are we excited? Are we, are we happy that it's all going to go wrong? Badly, badly wrong? Good. Okay. Um, by the way, if you're out in TV land and you are on anything where you can talk, make sure you mute yourself because otherwise we're going to have all kinds of trouble. Okay. Uh, and by the way, make sure you mute yourself. Um, if you have questions, you can send them, other than the folks here in the room, if you have questions, you can send them to supercomputing in plain English, all one word, at gmail.com. Okay. Uh, and you can get all the instructions for this from the webpage, www.oscar.ou.edu slash education. So if anything goes wrong, we're still good. If you want to watch on YouTube, just go to YouTube and search for two words, supercomputing, space, in plain English, all one word. Um, and we thank Skylar Donahue at OneNet uh, for pulling this together for us. Um, we're also on Twitch. Did anybody here know that Twitch was a thing? I didn't, I'd never heard of it before. Apparently it is a service where you can watch people play video games. I didn't know that was a thing, but apparently that's a big thing. So twitch.tv slash sipe2018. Um, and you can watch all of these, by the way. Any of these methods should work from your um, laptop, desktop, uh, your phone, or your tablet. Uh, and then uh, we have Wowza, which is out there broadcasting for us. So here's the URLs for that. There are two different URLs. The first one is much, much better. So use that one. Uh, and uh, we, oh, the, the phone bridge is no longer toll free, but it is on. It only handles, I think, 100 connections. So only use it if everything else fails for you. We do have the phone on, but we've got the sound turned down to zero. So you can't ask us questions on the phone. OK, uh, mute yourself. Uh, questions by email again, supercomputing in plain English, all one word, at gmail.com. Uh, if you try to use any of the chats for questions, nobody's monitoring those. We have two people monitoring the email address and nobody monitoring anything else. So uh, don't try and use the chats. If you're in the room, again, your two choices are either you fill out and turn in the talent release form or you sit behind the camera and you don't say anything. Okay, um, I've put up the tentative schedule. This is subject to change. Uh, hopefully won't change very much, but uh, there'll be at least one week when we don't have a session because I felt it would not be fair to people here on site if we didn't have a session the week that the university was closed for spring break. So we won't be doing that. I know some of you are grad students, so you don't get to take spring break anyway. Uh, some of you are faculty or staff, so you totally don't get spring break, but uh, there's that option. I want to thank everybody. A lot of people are helping with this, um, and um, they are working very hard. Pretty much the whole team of the OU Supercomputing Center for Education Research is helping us today, so uh, we're very grateful to them. Uh, also, the network team has been helping us and our CIO, uh, and uh, over at OneNet, which is our state Research, Education, and Government Network. Uh, Skylar Donahue has been a hero uh, and has made all of this possible. He's the one who told me that Twitch uh, was a thing and that people would be excited to have access to that. Uh, and then over at Oklahoma State, uh, my counterpart there, Dana Brunson, uh, ha is lending us one of the um, Zoom uh, licenses. So we're doing really good here. And again, everything will fail. It'll be so exciting. Are you excited? How many of you are excited about the failure? Yes, two people are excited about how much it will fail. Many exciting events coming up uh, this year. Uh, some of them in spring, some of them in fall. You won't want to miss them. And those of you out in TV land, you'll go, you're going to want to show up and enjoy it with us. So make sure that you have an opportunity to come to all of these events. Some of them are free, and other ones of them cost money. So start budgeting now. All right. So uh, literally the only closer to the microphone I could get would be right here, but I'll try and shout real loud when I'm over there. How's that? Yes, question. Also, this is the only one that is considered to be better because the power is on you and not the Oh, geez. Okay. Let me see if I can fix that. The best I can do for that, let me see. 
Give me a second. I'm going to try some magic. Oh, no, nope, they took that away from me. Back to meeting. There we go. Uh, da, 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 da. I had a thing. I'm going to cancel new share. Uh, hey, Henry, stop I'm sharing. getting your... No, stop your sharing. Slides, but not your video. Share again. And let's see if I share my desktop, whether that changes anything. It was working beautifully before. Uh, what do they see now? See, I told you this was an experiment. We have to give them a second. Nothing, anything? Okay, um, I'm gonna try one other thing. And then they can tell us. If they say it was working perfect before, then let me know, but um, do 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 do. And we are recording too, nice. Okay, whoop, hang on. And I'm gonna go back to share, but I'm gonna try and share the slides. I swear it worked beautifully before. Let's see what happens here. Ugh. All right, then we're just gonna have to do it large screen. And I'll just try and get rid of this as much as I possibly can. Unpin, there, we'll make that work. Okay. That stepped all over my great joke, too. All right, so, uh, it's kind of, can we turn the lights down in here? Um, in the back, that metal thing with the little lights on it, and then all the way on the other side, it's companion. Yeah, turn it down to like the lowest setting or something. There, now we can see the slides. Same thing over on the other side. See, it's another miracle of modern technology. All right, so, I'm gonna distill this whole talk down to its essence, are you ready? These are people, Thank you. And here are some things. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Okay. Wouldn't that be nice? I actually went to that talk one time. Guy got up and he showed a page of formulas and he said, these are some numbers. And then he put up a picture and he said, this is a result. And he sat down. We gave him a standing ovation. It's beautiful. All right. Now, the way I give this talk is a little weird, but I promised you I would make it worth your while. So the way I give this talk is I'm going to ask you questions. And the answers to those questions are going to be on the slide behind me. So you can make yourself seem like a genius without doing any actual thinking by just saying what it says on the slide. So, what is supercomputing? So you get a prize. It's a t-shirt, look at the, oh uh, yeah, there. It's actually a, um, it's a polo shirt, look at that, all right. You won the best prize. We only just got started, all right, good. So supercomputing is the biggest, fastest computing right this minute, then therefore, what is a supercomputer? One of the biggest, fastest computers. Oh, look at this. You get a, a travel mug. Yeah, I'm gonna start throwing these to the people in the back of the room, so that's gonna work out really well. Right, so supercomputer, biggest, fastest, one of the biggest, fastest computers right this minute. Why do I say right this minute? It's always changing in what direction? Faster and? Well, as long as by smaller you mean bigger. So this is where I get to tell another joke. So if cars had improved over the last 50 years, the way computers have improved over the last 50 years, your car would fit in a matchbox, it would go the speed of light, and it would crash every 10 minutes. Okay, so, by smaller, you mean the size of the components, but as the components get smaller, what gets bigger? Well, speed, yes, but also capacity, yes. So when I say big by size, I don't necessarily mean how much of the room it takes up, I mean how much capacity. Good. So supercomputers are always getting bigger and always getting faster. How fast are they getting bigger and faster? I have a slide for that. Now, here's a good rule of thumb. If it's a um, hundred times as big and fast as what you have on your lap or your desk, then you could probably call it a supercomputer, okay? That's just round figures, but now, in the world of supercomputing, we don't call supercomputing, yes, question? Yeah, Skyler was saying that your, uh, your 
camera Which camera? Looking at me? Yeah, yeah cuz it can't. Okay. Right. I can't I can't get it to do that. So everybody should just see They should just see the slides. That's correct. Echo in the webcast on which medium? Um, are other people on YouTube getting a an echo on YouTube? Really? Okay. Can somebody pull up you? Can you pull up YouTube on yours and see? Uh, you just search for supercomputing as one word and in plain English as the other word. Okay. They may have something old then. Tell them to refresh. Okay. Now in the world of supercomputing, we don't call supercomputing supercomputing. Because if we call supercomputing supercomputing, then you might think you know what we're talking about, and then we can't charge you a lot of money for our time. How many of you do that professionally? Or plan to? Okay, everybody in this room is lying to me. Okay. So we have other terms like high performance computing or high end computing or cyber infrastructure is a wonderful term. Um, and of course, we're techno geeks, so therefore we're terribly fond of TLAs. Anybody know what a TLA is? It's a three-letter acronym. We love our three-letter acronyms. So we don't say high-performance computing, we say HPC. So you're gonna see that in the slides, that's just to save room, okay? Now, I said supercomputers are getting faster and faster and bigger and bigger all the time, okay? So this is an actual picture of that. So we can see, I'll point it out over here, um, we can see this sort of pinkish straight line here. That's Moore's Law. How many of you have heard of Moore's Law? What does Moore's Law tell us? Yes? Computing speed and capacity go up with time. How fast? Anybody know? Every two years they do what? It doubles every two years. So every two years, the speed of the computer doubles. Every two years, the capacity of the computer doubles, right? Now, by the way, notice it's logarithmic in the vertical here, because if I made it linear in the vertical, it would just go swoosh, and it wouldn't be a very interesting graph. But here, again, this straight sort of pinkish purple line, that's Moore's law. That's computers doubling in speed every two years. Now, this dark, jaggy line above it, that's the fastest supercomputer in the world measured about every six months. Okay, there's a wonderful website, top500.org. I've referenced it down here. And it shows the 500 fastest supercomputers in the world. And they publish a new one every June and November. Yes? Okay, Jeremy Everett says, uh, love your enthusiasm, but control your emotions. Stay pointed towards the mic. Okay, so I'm going to try and get louder and softer as we go. It's going to be brilliant. Okay, so... Um, fastest supercomputer in the world, and you notice that supercomputers are getting faster and faster, faster than computers are getting faster and faster. So why is that? We'll explore that toward the end of the session, time permitting, okay? What is supercomputing about? Speed and size. Yeah, okay, so two prizes here, let's see what we got. Okay, here is a lovely, um, that you can write stuff in, and, oh, a t-shirt. Much excitement, okay. I'm running out of toys from that bag. Okay, yeah, size and speed. So when I say supercomputing is about size, what am I talking about? Good, flesh that out, hint, slide. What does it say on the slide behind? Come on in, don't be shy. Hey. Good to see you. I thought I heard your voice. Yep. Yeah. So what do I mean by size? Yeah. Memory. Good. So how many of you have a laptop or desktop PC that has one gigabyte or more of RAM? One gigabyte or more. Good. Two gigabytes or more of RAM. Four or more? Eight or more? Sixteen or more? Thirty-two or more? Okay. What do you, what, what do each of you have? Of RAM or of disk? I'm sorry. <laughs> by the way, by the way, you can buy a terabyte of RAM today. No. So I, I was going to accept that as an answer. No, it's okay. <laughs> what and what do you have on RAM? 
How much? 80? Wow. Okay, I have 12, so I hate you. Yeah, you have 16, I hate you anyway. I only hate you marginally. I hate him a lot. Okay, so um, now how, how about hard drive? How many of you have 250 gigabytes or more of hard drive or SSD if that's what you have? Okay, 500 gig or more, disk drive. A terabyte or more, two terabytes? Okay, so the biggest, so you, how, much ter how many terabytes of disk do you have? You have two terabytes, okay, so I hate you. Still hate you. Less than him, but I still hate you, okay. So I, on this one, I've actually got two hard drives in here, but together they add up to less than a terabyte, so um, I don't have that much. Okay, so suppose I had a problem that was bigger than 80 gigabytes of RAM and bigger than two terabytes of disk, or bigger than two terabytes of disk. Could I run it on his PC or any PC in the room? So then what would I need? I'd need a supercomputer, good. Now when I say supercomputing is about speed, what am I talking about? Hint, slide. Okay, so what's flops? Floating point operations per second, good. So what about them? Hint, slide. I want to be able to process more in less time. Why is that good? By the way, I agree. But why would I want to process more in less time? Why is it good to save time? Why do I want my results quicker? By the way, I totally agree, but why? Why is that good? I, I completely agree with you, but why? Because, okay, say it again. Time is money. Exactly correct, yes, because time is money, right? We'd like to think that it's not all about the money, right? We want to think that it's the good, warm-hearted stuff. What is it all about? It's all about the money. Okay, so, um, and by the way, so what are the advantages of getting the result quicker? Why, is, why do we want to get the result quicker? Because you can get more stuff done the same amount of time. Absolutely. Why is it good to get more stuff done? <laughs> In the end, that's what it comes down to. We want to be more productive. Whatever your value system is, whether it's earning a profit, whether it's publishing papers, um, whether it's providing a service to someone, whatever your value system is, doing more of that is better, right? So if you can do more in the same amount of time, that's better, right? I can publish more papers this year. I can earn more profit for my company this year, whatever it may be. Okay, so suppose I had a problem that I could do on my laptop in a month. Is that good or bad? Doing this problem on my laptop in a month. How many of you vote that's good? How many, oh, nobody voted good. Okay, how many of you vote that's bad? Okay, everybody votes it's bad. All right, why is it bad? That's a lot of time, okay? So if that's a lot of time, um, then What's the, the negative implication of it taking a lot of time? In real life, practical implication. You're gonna run something, big number crunching job on your laptop for a month. You can't do much else on your laptop because it's gonna consume all of the CPU, probably a lot of the RAM. You're not gonna get anything else. You can't even do your email, right? Your laptop is running super hot and you can't use it for anything else. How many of you can go without doing email for a month? How many of you can do that? I'm sorry, without getting fired. Okay, so not practical to not have your laptop for a month. What's another downside? Thank you, yes. How many of you have had your laptop stay up for a full month without crashing? Okay, somebody here is lying, but we'll see. Okay. <laughs> Goodness knows it's never happened to me. So I don't know if you guys know some magical secrets, but I've never had that happen, right? So what happens if you run for 29 days and on day 30 your laptop crashes? You've gotta start all over again. So now it doesn't take one month, right? It takes two months, except what's gonna happen on, on day 28 in the second month? Your laptop's gonna crash again. Will you ever get done? No, you're never gonna get done. Is that good or bad? What's gonna happen to you? Yeah, you're fired. Or if you're the CEO of the company, the company will go bankrupt because you never get anything done, right? Okay, but suppose this problem would take a month to do on your laptop, 
Suppose we could run it on the supercomputer in an hour. Would that be good or bad? How many of you vote that's good? Ooh, lots of votes. How many of you vote that's bad? How many of you vote it depends? Oh, why do you say it depends? Well, but suppose this problem I can run on the supercomputer in an hour. Where I, I'm making up a magical theoretical. I, I'm positing that, that this particular problem is the sort of problem that on the supercomputer we can run an hour. So I'm making up this case. It's, it's, it's purely hypothetical. But suppose it's a case of something to run on your laptop in a month or on the supercomputer in an hour. Is that good or bad to run it on the, on the supercomputer in an hour? Okay, so what if, I'm gonna, I'm gonna teach you an important rule. So anytime I ask you for a value judgment, is it good or bad? The answer is always, it depends. So suppose you could run on the supercomputer in an hour, but I have to charge you a million dollars a minute. Oh, suddenly you're not interested. Okay, all right, so all of the conditions change, don't they, right? So the answer is gonna always be it depends. So what is the answer? Is it good or bad to run in an hour on the supercomputer? It depends. By the way, I will not charge you a million dollars a minute to run on our supercomputer. If you are an academic or rather a not-for-profit research and or education organization, then uh, you, and you're in Oklahoma, you can use our supercomputer for free. All right, so what do we use supercomputing for? What's a category? Hint, blue, boldface, underline, italic of things we use supercomputing for. What? Simulation. simulation. Okay, what does it mean to simulate? Reproduce. Reproduce. Good. What else? Give me another word. For simulate. Model. Good. I love that. That's a nice science word. Now give me a kindergarten word. Uh, we're going to get that down that in the third one. Something we used to do when we were in kindergarten. We would say, let's blank that we are Disney characters. Say it again. Pretend, yes, simulate means pretend. We're gonna have the computer, the supercomputer, pretend to be a tornado or an oil reservoir or a molecule or a star system, whatever it is that we're studying. We're gonna have it pretend. So for example, um, OU of course is a big weather school, so one of the things they do, they do lots of weather simulation. The way you forecast the weather, you take a snapshot of the weather right now, so satellites and radars and ground stations and weather balloons and even commercial aircraft are constantly sampling weather data as they fly around. Um, you'll take all of that, you mush it together to get a picture of the weather right now, what we call the initial conditions. You plug that into the software that simulates weather physics processes and out comes a simulation by applying those physics processes of how weather behaves. And what the simulation shows 24 hours from now, that's our prediction of what the weather will be 24 hours from now. And then 24 hours goes by, it turns out we're totally wrong, but that's okay, because we already have your money, and then tomorrow we do it again, right? How many of you are in the weather business? Okay, one person, is that roughly the business? Sure, okay, yes. In back and not on camera, so you can get away with nodding. All right, good. Okay, what's another category? Hint, blue, italic, underline, boldface. Data mining, what does that mean? You are absolutely correct. You get a, I don't know what is in here, but whatever it is, you get it. I'm just trying not to hit other people in the face. Okay, so, yes, finding needles of information in a haystack of data. So, um, a big one, of course, nowadays is um, genomics, right? How many of you have heard the term next generation sequencing? Is anybody in the bioscience business? Okay, we have one bioscientist. Okay, so next generation sequencing, how much data does that produce? A little or a lot? A lot. It used to be a little, but that was like 25, 30 years ago. I guess early 90s, so 25 years ago. It used to produce only a little bit of data. Now it produces an enormous amount of data. I've got a picture of that later on. Um, so you need a way to choose, because you can't just look at the data by eyeball, right? Anybody know how many ACGT there are in the human genome, roughly? Bioscience person, you should know that. Yeah, you didn't know you were coming to an exam, did you? Do you remember roughly the number? That looks like a no. Okay, three billion base pairs, three billion of the ACGT. 
in the human genome. Can you just look at that with your eyeballs and make sense out of it? No, you're gonna need help from the computer to, to chew through that stuff, looking for interesting patterns that then turn into interesting proteins that then turn into interesting structures like you know, your nose or your brain. Um, and then you're especially looking in many cases for interesting structures that are not how they should be. So to give you a very concrete example, my aunt and my grandmother both died of Alzheimer's when they were in their mid 80s. And I'm feeling okay so far, but I just wanna let you know, and bioscientists in particular, um, you've got about 30 years to get this worked out. So no pressure, but it's gotta get done. And guess what's gonna be super helpful for you? Supercomputers, absolutely. Okay, in fact, um, the, the gene sequencing stuff, that is job security for people like me. Okay, and then what's the third category? Boldface, uh, underline, italic, blue. Visualization, what does that mean? <laughs> Turning data into pictures. So suppose I have a stack with a trillion numbers, right? I, I print out a trillion numbers, and I hand you this giant pile of paper with a trillion numbers on it. Are you gonna be able to make head or tail of that? Will that mean anything to you? Shake your head louder with your mouth. No, no not at all. But suppose I give you a picture of that trillion numbers, or even better, a movie of the trillion numbers, or even better, a video game of the trillion numbers, where you can walk around inside the trillion numbers. Now will that make sense to you? Now will you be able to get some insight out of your trillion numbers? Because the purpose of computing is not numbers. The purpose of computing is insight. Okay, now, this is the single most important slide in the entire talk. This is everything important about supercomputing with nothing left out. How many of you believe me? How many of you believe that I can distill everything about supercomputing down to two bullet points? How many of you believe it? Anybody? Two? A few of you? How many of you do not believe it? Reserving judgment. Okay, a lot more reserving judgment than actually believe me. This is, I promise you, everything important about supercomputing with nothing left out. Are you excited? So what are the only two issues that we are concerned about in the world of supercomputing? Hint, slide. Storage. The storage hierarchy and parallelism. What does it mean, parallelism? Yes, doing multiple things at the same time. You, you used a $10 word simultaneously, but I distilled that back, back down to at the same time. So how many of you, either you do this or you have family members or friends who do this, you are reading a book while watching TV, while talking on the phone with your friend, while listening to music, uh, while playing a video game. How many of you do that or know someone who does that? Okay, now, when you're doing all of those things, are you literally doing all of those things in the same moment? Shake your head louder with your mouth. No, you're not. What are you doing instead? You're switching from one to another. In the computing world, we call this time slicing. So that's, the technical term for that is concurrency, but that's not parallelism. Parallelism is where you're literally doing all of those things in the exact same moment. Are you excited? Okay. So, all boils down to that. How many of you have seen Pirates of the Caribbean? And by this, I mean the good one, the first one. Okay, all right. How many of you then went and saw the other four and you sort of felt stupid and dirty when you came out of the theater because you paid money for that? Okay, how many of you admit you're gonna go see the next one when it comes out? Which it inevitably will, because they each make a pile of money, right? Okay, so, but the first one, there's that scene where they're marooned on the desert island and they have been drinking the rum, there's a big bonfire going, and Captain Jack Sparrow says this. He says, what a ship is. It's not a keel and a hull and a deck and sails. That's what a ship needs. But what a ship is, what the black pearl really is, is freedom. Then he curls his mustachios and passes out. But, so this is a really important point. Now, how many of you have heard the term cluster in the context of a supercomputer? Okay, so what is a cluster? It's a bunch of CPUs and, and in order to get that, we typically have a bunch of PCs, okay? So it's a bunch of PCs. What else do they need? Hint slide. 
They need to be connected with a network. What else? They need some software to make it possible to do stuff, right? But that doesn't make it a supercomputer. You can have all of those components and you're still not a supercomputer yet. To be a supercomputer, what you actually need is you need all of those pieces to believe so hard that it, they're one big computer that it actually comes true. And what I mean by that is you don't become a supercomputer until all of those components, or at least a big subset of them, are working together on a single problem that no one of those pieces could do on its own. A problem that's either too big or would take too long, or both. Okay. So here's a picture of that. This was our very first cluster supercomputer here at OU back in 2002. So this is now, what, 16 years ago? Before my long white beard made it all the way down to the floor, you know? Um, and the reason I like showing this picture is you really can see this in a very clear way in this photo. So if you look at the part on the right, and in particular, if you look at the part on the right in the picture on the right, what you'll see, that stack of silver-backed boxes, those are PCs. Now, they're not shaped like a regular PC, but they got the same stuff inside them. Same kind of CPU, same kind of RAM, same kind of disk, same kind of network. They do have an extra network that's even better than your usual network. But um, chugging along very nicely. Um, and then on the left of the right-hand picture, that's the network. Now, what you can't see because it's a still photo is lots and lots of lights blinking. There's nothing better than blinky lights to tell you you've got a really high-quality supercomputer. So we had beautiful blinky lights on that. Um, tragically, the, the networks we have nowadays, not enough blinky lights. Okay, um, how many of you are experts on computing? And how many of you are normal people? Okay, good. All right, so in that case, um, let's talk about what's, a, what's inside a computer. So, and by the way, here's my actual laptop. These are the actual specs for my actual laptop. I did add a second hard drive, an SSD, um, but... Other than that, this is pretty much the same specs as when I bought it, okay? What are the components that we find inside a computer? And by the way, I should tell you, anytime anybody starts categorizing in an engineering context, they're totally lying to you. So I am officially lying to you. Everything on this slide is a lie. However, it is a useful lie. I am oversimplifying to make this more straightforward, okay? So what are the components of any computer? What do we find inside? CPU, yes, and I, I, I probably have some toys I can give you in exchange for reading these. Oh, a Frisbee. Who would like a Frisbee? Yell off what's on the slide and you get a Frisbee. Nobody wants the Frisbee? I gotta get rid of it. I promised my wife I would get the stuff out of the garage. You want the Frisbee? Okay, there you go. Hey, I did pretty good. All right. Now you have to read out loud what it says on the slide, though. No, go ahead. Yep. Yep, mm-hmm, and exactly correct, good. CPU, primary storage, secondary storage, input and output. All right, let's talk about the CPU. What is the CPU? It's the brain, now is it really a brain? No, so I put brain in scare quotes, but it's the thing that does what we think of as computing. And the CPU um, has several components inside of it, <clears throat> and we'll just talk about a few of them. So what's the, the big one that, that's kind of the gateway to everything else? And I will dangle a toy at you. Oh, oh my. I have all these beads. I'm not even sure how I got these, but I have a lot of them. So if anybody would like a necklace. Anybody have kids who want something shiny? No? All right. Nobody wants that. Toy. Let's see what else I got here. Oh, oh, look. Seriously, I have a wooden spoon. This is from Louisiana State University. I'm not gonna throw this, um, but who would like a wooden spoon in exchange for telling me about the first component? Yes, you may have this delicious wooden spoon. Okay, let's control unit and figure out what to do next. Yes. For example. Give me some examples of what the control unit might do next. Uh, it may choose to learn or whether or not to load data from memory or to add two drives together or to store data in storage or to decide which of the two possible actions which we know as? Branches. Yes, so all of those wonderful things. So basically, the control unit's job is to decide what everybody else is supposed to be doing. Okay, how many of you have had that boss? 
really nobody? Okay, one person willing to, how many of you are that boss? Okay, many of you will become that person. Okay, what's next? After the control unit, we have the, oh, look at this beautiful bag. <laughs> oh, sure, now you want. Sure, sure. Okay, so Tara, tell me about the ALU. Tell me about the arithmetic logic unit. Yes, it does calculations like what? Give me examples. Yes, so beyond the ones I listed on the slides, what other kinds of calculations might a, an ALU do? In addition to addition and multiplication. Huh? Subtraction, sure. So yes, subtraction is closely related to addition. So is multiplication for that matter. What else? Division, exactly correct, good. Division is closely related to multiplication, but on the other hand, how you do division is very different from how you do multiplication. How many of you did long division in grade school? That's basically what CPUs do, which for the record is why it takes a lot longer on a computer to do a bunch of divides than a bunch of multiplies. Multiplies, super duper fast. Divides, painfully slow. Guess what's even slower than that? Square root. Square, how many of you have ever done the long division-like way of doing square root? Anybody learn that? Yeah, I've seen that one. Okay, so that takes even longer. Um, we'll, we'll talk about that as we get deeper into the semester, but one of the big ones that takes forever is raising this non-integer to that non-integer power. That takes forever. Okay. I, I lie. It takes like a tiny fraction of a tiny fraction of a second, but still. Okay. Um, and then what's the last component of the CPU? Registers. What are registers? Right. So they're little tiny storage locations inside the CPU where data lives when it's actually being operated on. So if I want to add two numbers together, the add end has to be in a register. The aug end has to be in a register. And when I press the magic add button, the sum is going to end up in a register. Okay. So that's essentially what registers are. Now let's talk about primary storage. By the way, there are two kinds of people in the world. People who split the world into two kinds of people and people who don't. So there are two kinds of storage in the world. What are they? Hint, look at the title of the slide. Primary and? Very good, okay. So under the category of primary storage, what are the two types of primary storage? RAM and cache, okay. So tell me about RAM or main memory. Okay. By the way, what does RAM stand for? Random access memory. What's the opposite of random access memory? Yeah, we're trying to figure out what's the opposite of random. So the answer, anybody know? So the answer is sequential access. So what's an example of a sequential access storage technology? Tape. Tape. Yes, how many of you remember audio cassettes? It's good. How many of you regularly use audio cassettes anymore? Okay, literally not one hand goes up. Okay. So... In the olden days, when there were audio cassettes, and you used to make someone, if they were your friend, or if you wanted to go out with them or something, you'd make them a mixtape, right? How many of you remember mixtapes? How many of you remember mixed CDs? What do the kids make now? Playlists. How much love and effort goes into making a playlist? About five minutes. How much time had to go into making a mixtape? at least an hour, usually several hours. So you actually had to record it. You couldn't, you couldn't interrupt that. You actually had to go through the whole thing at speed, right? So suppose someone makes you this beautiful mixtape full of love, and your favorite song is at the beginning of side A, and your second favorite song is at the beginning of side B. What do you have to do? You've got to march from one end of the tape to the other, right? You can't just skip. So you either fast forward and then flip it over, or you flip it and rewind, right? But you've got to march from one end to the other. That's the opposite of random access. Random access means you can jump from anywhere to anywhere else magically in zero time. Okay. Now, of course, it's not literally zero time, but it's close enough. Let's think of it as zero time. Later, we'll find out it's worse than zero time. But, okay. So when do data live in RAM? In the slide. Yes, when it's being used by a program that's doing what? Currently running, exactly correct, good. So um, if I'm running a program, so right now I'm running PowerPoint, where are my slides? My data, 
in RAM. Exactly correct. Good. Okay, what's cache? A small area of much faster memory. That's exactly correct. Good. So, um, when do data live in cache? If it's faster, when do we want them in the fast stuff? Yeah, by the time we need them, right? When they're about to be used. So data show up in cache when they're about to be used, or if they've just been used, they probably haven't been picked out. All right, I'm sorry, go ahead, question. Oh, such a great question. I love your question. Can you wait maybe three or four slides and we'll totally talk about that? Because that is the perfect question to ask. I love that question. Okay, let's talk real quick about secondary storage. So um, give me some examples of secondary storage. Hit slide. CD, go on. Hard drive, sure. Floppy, oh, how many of you remember floppies? How many of you still use floppies? Oh, so many, zero hand, oh wait, wait, you do use them? For decoration. For decoration, that does not count. But I will, however, give you a prize. This is a bouncy ball, so that ought to be fun. Oh, good catch, all right, very nice. Okay, so you got a bouncy ball. All right, so when do data live on secondary storage? So when you plan to use them sometime in the future, okay, when you're gonna get to them. So um, let's talk about the exciting part of that. But before we get to that, IO, very boring. I have one slide, we're not gonna talk about it. All right, let's talk about the storage hierarchy. And this is gonna roll back to your question, right? You're gonna love this part. So let me give you an analogy. Suppose I want you to move your best friend from Maine to Mexico on land as fast as you possibly can. Here's a million dollars. So what are you gonna spend your million dollars on? What are you gonna buy to move your friend from Maine to Mexico on land as fast as possible? A Jaguar, right, I put a Formula One. I'm not sure actually whether you can take a Formula One out on the open road, but never mind. So a super fast, expensive car, right? Okay, so far so good? Okay. Now suppose I tell you I want you to move your 100 best friends from Maine to Mexico on land as fast as possible, but not per person, as fast as possible for the hundred of them. Now what are you gonna spend your million dollars on? A bus, a train, I don't know if you can get a train for a million dollars, but you can get a bus for sure for a million dollars, absolutely. I, I put here a, a fleet of, of little cars, right? But the same idea, I'm gonna wanna get something cheap and junky, but a lot of it, right? Because that's gonna move the bunch of them as fast as possible, okay? Same principle applies to computing. So in computing, we want things that are fast for a few, we can't afford enough of that for many. So um, the rule is, if something is fast, then it's expensive. If it's expensive, can you afford much of it? No, you cannot. But if something is slow, then it's cheap. If it's cheap, can you afford much of it? Absolutely. So registers are blindingly fast. And I'll show you some real numbers in a little bit. Registers are blindingly fast. Um, they're terribly expensive, although I can't show you numbers for that. Um, and therefore, you have hardly any registers. So current CPUs are running at several kilobytes. How many of you remember kilobytes? How many of you ever owned a computer where the word kilobyte even came up? Be honest. Okay, I did back in 1970 Mumble, when my dad got me a TRS-80. I was the first geek on the block to have their own computer. We didn't even call them personal computers back then. We called them microcomputers, right? That's a word that's fallen out of use. Um, but my TRS-80 had four kilobytes of RAM. So very, very exciting. By the way, huge excitement when my dad paid 200 bucks, which was a lot of money in the late 70s, 200 bucks to get me the upgrade to 16 kilobytes of RAM. To give you the feel of it, that's about enough RAM to hold 16 emails worth of text, which is to say, it's like no RAM at all, right? You literally cannot buy that small amount of RAM anymore. Okay, um, so cache is almost as um, fast, sorry, is not as fast as registers, still quite fast, 
therefore pretty expensive, and I can talk about what cash costs, um, therefore quite small. So a typical CPU today has a few to several megabytes of cache. Okay. Main memory is quite cheap, therefore, uh, sorry, is quite slow, therefore quite cheap, therefore pretty big. So today, um, several to even tens of gigabytes is normal on a PC, depending on how much money you want to spend. So again, this one here, my laptop, 12 gigabytes of RAM. Hard drive, um, slower, therefore cheaper, therefore bigger, right? Again, hundreds of gigabytes or even terabytes. Uh, removable media, you can have stacks and stacks of them. And then of course the internet is gigantic, but terribly slow. How many of you have had that experience? The internet is slow. Nope. If your hand isn't up, you're kidding yourself. Okay, now, um, let's talk about this RAM is slow business. Is RAM fast or slow? How many of you vote RAM is fast? How many of you vote RAM is slow? How many of you vote compared to what? Oh, yes. So if I say something is fast or slow, is that an absolute? Or is it a relative thing? It's relative. So it's not that RAM is fast, it's not that RAM is slow, it's RAM is faster or slower. RAM is slower than CPU, by a little or by a lot? By a lot. So on my laptop, and these are the real numbers. I looked this stuff up. I even ran some benchmark performance tests to find out. On my laptop, if I could keep my CPU fed, it could chew through over 650 gigabytes per second. My RAM can only do 15 gigabytes per second. So which one of them gets to decide how fast I get my work done? The RAM, the slow one always wins, right? It's like trying to shoot a fire hose through a drinking straw. You're just not gonna get that wet on the other end. Okay? So that's the, the term for that is that's a bottleneck, right? So cash doesn't solve this problem, but it does improve it, right? In engineering, can we ever solve a problem? In an engineering context, do you ever really solve the problem or do you just make it be not that bad? You gotta make the problems not that bad. So cash helps make the speed issue not that bad. So if you can get the data you need into cash by the time you need them, then you can get your work done much faster. But again, that's such a big if, it's job security for people like me, okay? All right, so here's my laptop. And now here is an actual table of actual numbers of real life, okay? So um, I mentioned about the over 650 gigabytes per second that my CPU could chew through. I can't talk about the price of the registers because you can't go out and buy more registers for your CPU. You can't even necessarily go buy a CPU that's the same as the other one except it has more registers. That's not really offered. But um, it turns out if you ask the people who design CPUs, oh yes, the registers are super duper expensive. That's why you don't have much. The other reason you don't have much, as it turns out, is having lots and lots of registers doesn't make the computer that much faster than only having a few. Is that weird? How many of you vote that's weird? How many of you vote that's not weird? There's an actual paper where they did a bunch of tests on this, and it turns out there's an upper limit to how much money it's worth spending to get more registers, and after that, the incremental improvement in performance is like a few percent. Doesn't help that. Okay, um, cash, so much, much um, slower than the registers, but still pretty fast. Um, much bigger. So, by the way, um, everything here is megabytes except that first one. So, three megabytes compared to 10 kilobytes. So, a factor of 300 bigger. Okay. Um, and I actually found two CPUs that, as far as I can tell, the specs are identical except for the amount of, of cache in them. And I got to tell you, I had to look at a lot of CPU specs to find these two. They differ in price today, or at least last week, by about $20 per megabyte. So that's roughly the cost of a megabyte, it's 20 bucks. Okay. So now I'm gonna answer your question. Why do we even have RAM? Why don't we just have cash? So let's say I wanted to have 10 gigabytes of this primary storage on my laptop at $20 per megabyte. How much is my laptop gonna cost? So let's see, so 10 gigabytes, so that's 10,000 megabytes at $20 per megabyte, so $200,000 for that laptop. 
How many of you are willing to pay $200,000 for a laptop every four years? Okay. How many of you are nowhere near that dumb? Okay, not that dumb. Very good. Okay, so if you're not that dumb, you want a better solution. So you're willing to trade um, that the storage will be slower than cash, which is, and that's a lot slower. You can see the numbers up here. You're willing to trade that away in exchange for you get a much cheaper laptop. And your laptop, even though it's much slower than it would be with all cash, is good enough. I'd much rather pay $200 or $2,000 for a laptop, again, every four years, than $200,000. Yes? Oh, yes. So if you, are, if you are in the financial industry, you are willing to pay top dollar. But even then, you can't afford two hundred thousand per because you still need a lot of them, right? You don't just need one PC to do the work; you need many. Okay. All right. Um, then RAM, you can see, is slower and it's much bigger. So, what did we get? We got a factor of four thousand more RAM than cash in my laptop. And look how much different it is in price, right? So, one penny per megabyte instead of twenty dollars per megabyte. So that's a pretty big difference, right? Um, but then if you look at my hard drive, look at this. It's 3%, sorry, it's 3 tenths of 1% of a penny per megabyte of hard drive. That's a pretty good, and by the way, that's just going and looking on, on various websites. Uh, there's a wonderful website called pricewatch.com that'll show you the prices everywhere else. Um, so um, you can see what things, uh, so I just looked up what's the cheapest one there. Okay. So you can see, all of these things are actually happening. Now, why is it? Why does the storage hierarchy actually work? Why is it that fast things are expensive, but slow things are cheap? Why? Anyone want to venture a guess? No one's going to buy it, but no one Oh, you're way ahead of me. Yes. Okay. See, you solved the problem. Usually we get guesses like, well, because the fast ones are very expensive to manufacture or whatever. And oftentimes those reasons are even true, but also irrelevant. What you just said is the correct answer. So I'm gonna put this in terms of what mathematicians call proof by contradiction. So suppose that I have a slow, expensive storage technology. I'm gonna magically make up a name for this. I'm going to call it arbitrarily. I will say that it's called floppy. Okay, so suppose I offer you a floppy at about 50 cents per megabyte. How many of you will buy 50 cents per megabyte? As opposed to, what did we come up with? One third of 1% of a penny per megabyte for hard drive, right? How many of you will pay 50 cents per megabyte? Okay, um, also I should mention that a floppy runs at about 30 kilobits, sorry, kilobytes per second, versus a hard drive will do a few tens of megabytes per second. So. Does that sound like a good deal? No, it's a terrible deal. And by the way, this, when I realized this, and I'm so embarrassed about how recently it was that I figured this out, when I realized this, it actually restored my faith in humanity. How many of you believe that this fact restored my faith in you? How many of you are very skeptical, reserving judgment about whether it was, okay, so this is true, I'm not making this up. So before I figure this out, I actually, I am a natural cynic and a pessimist, okay? And my, up until that point, my belief about not just my fellow human beings, but me as well, was we were all a bunch of morons with our eyes closed, feeling our way in the dark, stumbling over the furniture, and occasionally accidentally doing something useful. This is what I genuinely believed about all of us, okay? And then I figured this out. And this told me something very important about human beings. Because what happened to floppies? How many of you own a floppy drive today? How many of you use floppies regularly? How many of you have a box of them somewhere, but you haven't used them in like 10 years or more? Okay. How many of you don't even own any floppies anymore? Or you're not sure, okay? So why did we give up on floppies? Because they are a terrible idea anymore. They used to be a great idea 30 years ago, but now they're a terrible idea because they are tiny and slow, but expensive. So we don't buy them. So anything that doesn't fit the pattern of fast implies expensive, 
anything that doesn't fit the pattern of slow implies cheap, nobody buys. So it's not that you can't have a technology that doesn't fit that, it's that nobody will use it because it's terrible, right? But anything that fits there, and if tomorrow a new technology that came out that was faster than the registers we have today, all of the stuff that we buy today would become obsolete. But then immediately other new technologies would pop up and guess what? The fast ones would be more expensive, the slow ones would be more cheap, right? Because fast and slow are really faster and slower. Did that help? So that's why we don't buy that way. All right, let's talk about parallelism, okay? And I need to grab something from my bag while we're talking about parallelism. So I'm gonna yell really loud, don't be frightened, okay? Um, so um, what was parallelism? What did that word mean again? Remind me what parallelism means. Split the work, but not just split the work. What's happening inside the machine? Doing We're doing multiple things at the same time. Beautifully said. Exactly correct. Good. So, suppose that I go to Bass Pro Shop and I buy the most expensive fishing pole and the most expensive fishing line and the most expensive fish hooks and I go out to the lake. And you and 99 of your best friends, the 100 of you, get broom handles and bailing twine and bent paper clips, and the 100 of you go out to the lake. Who's gonna come home with more fish? Me with my amazing gear, or the 100 of you with your cheap junk? The 100 of you with your cheap junk. Every single time you're gonna win, right? Because more instances of it happening at the same time is gonna get the work done faster. Now, how many of you like jigsaw puzzles? I just saw you volunteer. You didn't know you were volunteering, did you? Okay, come up and sit right here. Okay. Now, the folks in TV land are not gonna be able to see this, but I'll show you the slides that capture the idea. All right, now I have this beautiful jigsaw puzzle for you. Here you go. Ready? Okay. Now, um, let's suppose, for the sake of argument, that you can do this puzzle in an hour. By the way, can you read what it says right there in the corner? Oh, a thousand. A thousand puzzle pieces, and also that one. Ages 12 and up. Ages 12 and up, so you're gonna be fine. <laughs> okay. So, it's no, no, don't, don't wait. Just go right ahead. Don't be shy. Just get right to work, a thousand puzzle pieces. Um, and uh, we're gonna say, for the sake of, go, no, go ahead, work hard. Oh, you need to look, okay, right. So it's a beautiful picture with a pair of kitty cats. Can everybody see the beautiful kitty cats? Okay, so beautiful picture, pair of kitty cats. That's all you're gonna get. So I hope you memorize that, because it's gonna, okay. So can we agree, for the sake of argument, that he can do this thousand piece jigsaw puzzle all by himself, in one hour. Can we agree on that for the sake of argument? Everybody agree? A thousand puzzle pieces, one hour. Everybody's agreed that you can do that in one hour, right? You're gonna have to work a lot faster than that. Okay. Now you just volunteered, didn't you? So yes. Of course you did. Scooch on over, come sit here. And the two of you are gonna work together, okay? I'm gonna dedicate. Yeah, that's not how that's gonna work. All right, so the two of you are working together. Now, if one of them can do the puzzle all by themselves in one hour, how long is it gonna take the two of them working together? Give me sort of the naive brute force answer. 20 minutes. No, you're jumping ahead here. How long is it gonna take, the two of them? Half an hour. Half an hour, why? Two of us. Same amount of work, twice as many workers, get it done in half the time, that seems reasonable, right? Except. From time to time will it happen that the two of them reach into the pile of puzzle pieces at the exact same moment, and then they have to do after you, no, after you, or maybe they'll fight. Does that happen from time to time? Is that gonna happen? Will that take time? Yes. Yes, so there's an overhead cost associated with contention for the shared resource. So far so good? Okay, now, Let's say that you're gonna do this kitty cat and you're gonna do this kitty cat, right? 
And let's say that they get to the point where they both finish their kitty cats and now they have to bring their halves of the puzzle together, yes? So are they gonna have to communicate to bring their, piece, their halves of the puzzle together? Yes, will that take time? Absolutely. Absolutely it will. So there's another overhead. We had the overhead associated with contention for the shared resource. And there's another overhead associated with communication at the shared interface. Okay. So now if I say, how long will it take the two of them, do we still believe it's half an hour? Less, more, or the same as half an hour? More, more because in addition to doing the work, they also have to have the overhead for contention communication. All right, how about the two of you? Can you come join us? Yes, come on up, don't be shy. You can just sort of stand here up in front, just sort of facing the puzzle pieces here. All right, so now there are four of them working diligently on the puzzle together. Will there be less, more, or the same contention for the shared resource? More. Will there be less, more, or the same communication at the shared interfaces? More. So if one of them could do it in an hour, two of them could do it in, let's say, 35 minutes, how long is it going to take four of them? 20 minutes, 25 minutes, somewhere in there, right? Okay. Now, everybody come in. No, I'm kidding. But if I did bring you all up here, would that make them faster? What would it make you? Slower. Slower. Why? Because there's too many people. So the overhead for contention would go up, right? More fights more often. And the overhead for communication would go up. More people to talk to, right? So far so good? Are we excited? Yeah. Okay. So now I want to change this up a little bit. By the way, so this is what we call in the computing world. By the way, in the computing world, what would be the workers? It would be the CPUs, right? And what's the resource that they'd be sharing together? Storage. Typically RAM, but sometimes it's disk. So far so good? Okay. So um, in the computing world, typically what we're going to see is that this shared memory parallelism is going to top out somewhere around 32 processors, give or take. Okay? So much beyond that, you're not going to get more value out of adding more processors because they're going to spend all their time fighting or talking. Okay? Now, um, it isn't always 32. It can be less than that, 16, 8, 4, 2, 1. Sometimes the fastest parallel approach is slower than the non-parallel, the serial approach. Good. Now, I'm going to change the conditions of the test. So I'm going to send the two of you back to your seats. I know you're having a lot of fun. <laughs> and I'm going to give you a fun, exciting test. Are you ready? Don't grumble. <laughs> Act like you're excited. Okay, fun, exciting test. I'm going to take half the puzzle pieces. I'm going to take exactly half the puzzle pieces. I'm going to take exactly the correct half the puzzle pieces. And I'm going to do that magically in zero time. Okay, can we agree on that for the sake of argument? Okay. And I'm going to give you the exact correct half of the puzzle pieces that I got magically in zero time. And I'm going to ask you to go sit in that corner way over, way over there, that chair way in the corner there. It's not because you misbehaved. It's just part of the thought experiment. Okay. So. He's got his half of the puzzle pieces. She's got her half of the puzzle pieces. So far, so good? Will there be less, more, or the same contention for the shared resource? Less how much? How much contention for the shared resource will there be? Why do you say zero? And I agree, by the way. Oh, we're not there yet. They're not, they don't have a shared resource anymore. They each have their own private resource, right? So contention actually goes to zero. So far so good? Now what about communication? Let's think about this case of, of the literal case of the jigsaw puzzle, right? You've got your part of the jigsaw puzzle here. She's got her part of the jigsaw puzzle over there. When they each finish their half of the jigsaw puzzle, what are they going to have to do? In the literal case of the jigsaw puzzle, forget commuting, in the literal case of the jigsaw puzzle, what are they going to have to do to bring their halves together? Yeah, you're going to have to move this table over there, or they're going to bring the tables together. They physically have to carry the tables, because you can't pick up the puzzle, right? It's going to fall apart. You have to physically pick. So compared to the cost of an individual communication when you're sitting right next to each other, is the cost of an individual communication now less, more of the same? 
more, a little more or a lot more? A lot more. On the other hand, are they tempted to communicate more than absolutely necessary? Yeah. Are you gonna yell at her a lot? Sure. Well, yeah, that, that's just a personality thing, right? Okay, so in real life, you're not gonna communicate more because it's expensive to communicate, right? So you're not gonna be doing that. What, question? I have a question. Please. The audience, in the context of steroid Yep. In the context of parallelism, is this like the law of diminishing returns in economics? In the case of shared memory parallelism, that is absolutely true. That as you keep throwing more and more processors at the problem with shared memory, almost always, there are exceptions, but it's quite common that adding more processors at some point, and usually that point is not that many processors, it doesn't add more speed and in fact can start slowing you down. That is absolutely true. So the law of diminishing returns from economics is a very good analogy to what's happening in the CPU context for shared memory parallelism. We're gonna talk in a minute about this distributed parallelism where it's a bit different, okay? So now we're distributed. How many of you, by the way, had this happen when you were in grade school? At the beginning of the school year, you sat next to your best friend and then one day, the teacher said, you, sit over there. How many of you had that happen? Okay. Why did the teacher make you go sit over there? Because you were spending too much time talking and not enough time getting your work done. And also, of course, you were dis disturbing everybody else. But let's stick with the analogy to computing, right? You were spending too much time talking. So by separating you, we reduce your ability to talk because the cost of communication is very high. Therefore, we reduce your temptation to talk more than absolutely necessary. So even though the cost of an individual communication has gone way up, the aggregate cost of communicating might come down. Ooh. Will that affect how many processors can work on the problem together? Can we get more if there's no contention? And if the aggregate cost of communication has come down. If the problem can be split up properly, that's a very good point, good. So we can add um, up to some point. Now, by the way, we also wanna make sure that we get a balanced load. Load balancing means getting the right amount of work to each of the processors. So suppose I give him twice as much work as her. Is that good or bad? How many of you vote that's bad? How many of you vote that's good? How many of you vote it depends? Oh, well, what does it depend on? I might have more processing power, maybe. Um, okay, so you might work faster. So if you work faster than her, should you be given more work? Now, I, I want to make sure we subtract out the moral judgment <laughs> part of this. This is only about getting the work done, not about whether that's the right thing from a moral perspective. Remember, these are computers, so the moral part doesn't apply that much. Uh, sure. Okay, so it really depends on the relative speed. So if they each work at the same speed, and I give him twice, much, twice as much work as her, is that good or bad? If they work at the exact same speed. How many of you vote that's good? How many of you vote that's bad? How many vote it depends? Now we get rid of all the depends. Okay, so. I agree, it's bad. Why is it bad? When, when one is gone, there, there will be their way. Yes. Why do I care about that? And by the way, I do. But why? Time is money. Time is money. So if she finishes up before he does, and she's just sitting idle, could we have taken some of his work and thrown it at I just ruined it all the time. And thrown it to her. And then she could work more, which means he would finish earlier. And by the way, she was gonna finish it at whatever time anyway, right? So it doesn't matter if she keeps working, it matters when he gets to stop, right? So it turns out that the, the fastest that the two of them, why did you stop? The fastest that the two of them can finish the problem is when they finish at the exact same moment because if one of them finishes before the other, we could have given the other some of that one's work, in which case they would have ended earlier. 
right? So getting them to end at the exact same moment, that's the minimum amount of time to do the work. Now, on the other hand, suppose he works twice as fast as her. Then should he get twice as much work to do? Yeah, because then they'll finish at the exact same moment. And that's our goal because that's the fast. The real goal, of course, is to do the work as quickly as possible. The way to do that is to have them finish at the same time. So load balancing does not mean giving them each the same amount of work. Load balancing does not mean giving them each a fair amount of work. Load balancing means giving them the right amount of work so that they end at the same time, okay? It turns out load balancing can be easy or it can be hard. I will now prove this. See? Okay. So on the left is, let's say, um, weather forecasting. So you take, let's say, the continental US, you split it up into chunks of equal size, you give a chunk to each of the processors, and they do the number crunching, um, and from time to time they talk to each other. The one on the right was my dissertation, which happily I did not have to load balance, somebody else did that. But um, that was an arbitrary collection of an arbitrary number of arbitrary size, arbitrary shape blocks that was changing arbitrarily over time. So it turns out that the best load balancing scheme for that thing, what I just said, which is hard to say, by the way, the best load balancing scheme is start by just randomly throwing the blocks to the processors, just randomly putting them wherever. And then observe and see which processors have too much work based on when they finish and which processors don't have enough. And then just redistribute, throw some from the overly busy ones to the less busy ones. And you're going to have to do that anyway, because remember, it's changing arbitrarily over time. So when you do it that way, you get not by any means perfect load balancing, but about as good as it's likely to get. Okay, now I promised we'd talk about Moore's Law. Debbie, how are we doing on time? You are at 1.4. Oh, okay, so we're okay. We're gonna go a little over, but it's not a crisis, and if you need to drop off, you're cool to drop off. Okay, so um, Gordon Moore, um, he wait, later went on to co-found and was, I think, the first CEO of Intel. Um, back in 1965, um, he was at a ch one of the early chip companies. There were hardly any. They had just started a few years before. These were the first, what we called back then, integrated circuits. And he noticed that the number of transistors you could squeeze on a chip was growing very rapidly. Initially, it was growing, it was doubling about every year, but it pretty quickly sort of steadied out to about doubling every two years, the number of transistors you could squeeze on a chip. So we call that transistor density. Um, it turns out that the speed and the capacity of a chip is roughly proportional to the transistor density. So um, essentially what the implication was is that computers were getting bigger and faster by doubling every two years. And again, that is the straight sort of pinkish lower line there, which again, this is um, logarithmic in the vertical in, in a linear linear graph, this would go swoosh. But um, so the, the straight line, that's Moore's law, doubling every couple of years. And then the upper jagged line, the dark line, that's the fastest supercomputer in the world from top500.org. Okay, fastest supercomputer in the world. And you can see that um, although it goes in a much more stair-step kind of way, where something will be the fastest in the world for uh, a year or two sometimes, um, you can see that supercomputers are getting faster and faster, faster than computers are getting faster and faster. So how's that possible? How could supercomputers be improving faster than computers? What did we get better at? Parallelism. We got better at parallelism, exactly correct. And I have some actual numbers, okay? So in 1993, in June of 93, the very first top 500 list that was published was about 1,000 CPU cores. And it could do about 60 billion calculations per second. The most recent one, which came out in November of 2017, the next one will be June. The most recent one was 10.65 million CPU cores. And yes, they have run a single application on all 10 plus million CPU cores all at the same time. They have actually done that. Okay? Not a lot of them, but they have done that. Um, and so that one is capable of doing 93 million billion calculations per second. Wow. Okay. And what we got better at, a lot better, we got a lot better at parallelism. Okay. And Moore's Law is an uncannily accurate prediction. It's one of the most accurate predictions in human history. So 
Intel came out with the great, 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 dot, 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 great, great, great grandmama of the current chips that we have from Intel, AMD, there's some other manufacturers who make what we call x86 chips. They came out with the 4004 back in 1971, and it had 2.3 thousand, 2,300 transistors in it. So in 2010, this is already now um, almost eight years ago. In 2010, they came out with a chip that had 2.3 billion transistors on it. Same size chip, a million times more processing power and capacity. Unbelievable. So transistor density has doubled about every 23 months over that, what was that? Um, 40 year period, over 40 year period that held steady. It's actually started to slow down a bit now because we're starting to get to the physical limits of what the current technology can do. The physics is starting to get weird, right? But um, unbelievably accurate prediction. So here's kind of a picture of this. Doesn't matter the year, doesn't matter the speed. And by the way, again, logarithmic in the vertical because otherwise it just looks like swoosh. But um, here's a picture of that CPU doubling every couple of years. Now here's the good news, network bandwidth is getting faster and faster, faster than CPU speed is getting faster and faster. Isn't that exciting? So the network's gonna solve all our problems, right? How many of you vote the network will solve all our problems? How many of you vote not so much? Okay, good. Smart people in the back there, good. Um, now the bad news is RAM is not improving as fast as CPU. So CPU doubling every 24 months. RAM is 30 to 36, maybe worse than that now, okay? So the gap between what the CPU can do and what the RAM can do is getting um, bigger and bigger all the time. But then here's the worst one. So I said network was getting faster and faster, right? But there's two measures of speed in networking. There's bandwidth, bits per second, and that's important. But an even more important measure in some cases is what's called latency, the time it takes for the first bit to show up. Latency is improving very, very slowly. Um, so I think we're now at the point where latency is getting cut in half about every five years or so, maybe even more than that. So that's terrible, right? So the gap between um, what the CPU can do and what the network can do for small messages is getting worse and worse. And now here's the really bad news, the software. Software is hardly improving at all. And you know why? Because it turns out writing fast software is very hard to do, very labor intensive, and it's literally the exact opposite of what you were taught in any programming course you ever took. In programming courses we teach you, have little pieces of data and do little actions on them. If you wanna get high speed, you need to have big chunks of data and do big actions on them. Go ahead. And then who, okay, yep, bioscientist. Gene sequencing, right? Yay, gene sequencing. Gene sequencing is improving by a factor of 10 every 16 months. There's no way the computing can keep up. So the big problem that the gene sequencing folks are facing is that they can't get the computing they need, right? That and the fact that, you know, by the time you install the machine, there's a new one come along that's made years obsolete. But leaving that aside, right? Enormous amount of data. So here's a picture to show you to illustrate Moore's Law. So in 1997, the very first machine that was capable of doing a teraflop, okay? a trillion calculations per second. Came out, it cost, well, nine figures. I don't know the exact dollar figure, but a, a, a few hundred million, I guess. Um, it filled up an entire room. Um, it was owned by one of the Department of Energy National Laboratories. Um, in 2002, we installed our first cluster supercomputer here at OU, and it could do a trillion calculations a second, just over. And it cost, uh, let's say, very high six figures, right? So the price had come down by a factor of 1,000 in five years. That's not too bad. By 2012, 10 years later, you could buy a card this big that you could pop into your workstation that would do a trillion calculations a second. And late last year, both AMD and Intel came out with chips, individual CPU chips, that will do a trillion calculations a second. Take a moment and wow on that. Right? So over the course of 20 years, we went from a room and hundreds of millions of dollars to a single chip that costs, I don't know, I, uh, maybe low four figures, I guess. 
maybe mid four figures. That's just amazing. Okay, um, I'm kind of out of town, but let me, let me just say this real quick. Um, supercomputing is hard. Supercomputing is a big pain. Remember we said, would it be good to do a problem on your laptop that takes a month or better to do it on a supercomputer in an hour? Well, here's the hidden secret about that. It's not that I'm gonna charge a million dollars per minute to use the supercomputer. It's that it's gonna take you six months or more to rewrite your software to run in an hour on the supercomputer. Is it worth it? It depends, thank you, excellent answer. What does it depend on? Uh, maybe you don't need to solve the problem now, but you need to solve it. You're gonna need to solve it later, right? Many, many times. Yeah, ah, ah, say it again. You're gonna need to solve the problem many, many times. If you're gonna be solving that kind of problem many, many times, then is it worth the six months or more that it takes to rewrite the software? Then it's worth it. If you're only gonna do it once, it's not worth it. On the other hand, is there such a thing as run once software in real life? How many of you have ever taken a programming course? Okay. So after you finished the programming project in the course, did you ever look at that software again? No. That was what we call run once code. You wrote it, you tested it, you got it to run, you ran it once with the test data, and then you threw it away. In real life, is there such a thing as run once code? No, because as soon as you run it, you show someone, your boss, your colleagues, whoever, and then they say, oh, that is fantastic. I want the following 30 features tomorrow morning, right? And it follows you around forever. You never escape the software you write, okay? So it's a lot of trouble. Is it worth it? Well, so it's good that supercomputers get you to solve the same problem faster. The thing that you used to be able to do in a month, you can now do in an hour. That's a win. But that's the trees, that's not the forest. The bigger win is if you're willing to invest the month, now you can solve a much bigger problem. Because if you can solve the month-long problem now in an hour, then in a month you can pro solve a problem, I'm gonna do this 24 hours a day times 30 days in a month, a problem 720 times bigger in that month. And doing the bigger problems is the big win. It turns out that the bigger the problem you can do, the more money you make or the more papers you publish or whatever your value system is, doing the bigger problems is gonna get you more of that. So it turns out that's the win. The other win, how many of you are students, by the way? Okay, so um, I'm gonna use undergrads because the numbers are a little simpler. So let's say for an undergrad, are anybody, is anybody here an undergrad? Okay, yeah, you undergrads, good. Okay, undergrads. To one significant figure, how old is a typical undergrad? Just to one significant figure. 20, good. To one significant figure, what's life expectancy in the US? Oh, I wish. 80-ish, okay. So how much time do you have left? 60 years. By the way, for the record, it goes like that. Okay, they, they don't believe me yet, but they will. Okay. So, you got 60 years left. Computing speed doubles every two years. How many doublings will you experience in your lifetime, the rest of your lifetime? You got 60 years, doubles every other year. 30 doublings, what's two to the 30th? You've memorized your powers of two to the 30th, right? No, okay. Anybody know two to the 10th? No, not Google. Anybody know what two to the 10th is? 1024, which to one significant figure is? Well, just to one significant figure, so just 1,000, okay? So if two to the 10 is 1,000, what's two to the 20? What's two to the 10 times two to the 10? 1,000 times 1,000. 1,000 times 1,000 is? A million, okay? So then what's two to the 30th? 1,000 times 1,000 times 1,000. A billion. So how much faster, so thinking about the computer you have today, and the computer that's gonna be on your lap the day you die, well, the day before you die. The day you die, it's not that useful. But the day before you die, the computer on your lap, how much faster will it be compared to the one you have today? Say it again. Billion. A billion times faster. Can we possibly imagine what we're gonna be able to do with a billion times more computing speed and capacity than we have today? All we know is it's gonna be amazing, right? Supercomputing doesn't get you to the factor of a billion. But here's a rule that's very important. Whatever happens in supercomputing today will be on your desk or your lap in 10 to 15 years. And by the way, 
in 30 years, it'll be a cell phone, right? So my cell phone is the fastest supercomputer of 30 years ago. So far, so good? So supercomputing, what it gives you is it gives you a peek at the future. It gives you a look at 10 to 15 years from now, because whatever we've got in supercomputing now, that's going to be your laptop 15 years from now. Is it useful to know the future? Is it easy to know the future in real life? How many of you are good at predicting the future? How many of you are terrible at predicting the future? Good, you're normal human beings, right? Predicting the future is hard. Predicting the future of technology, I don't want to say it's easy, but it's easier because again and again and again, we've seen that whatever's happening in supercomputing today, that'll be your laptop 15 years from now. Okay? So it gives you a competitive advantage because you know the future of technology. Because the problem with the future is the future comes too fast and in the wrong order. Now ask